uh, like to call the uh, December or excuse me, not December. Look at the, the February February sixth, uh, two thousand twenty, meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission of Santa Cruz County to order. Uh, please call the roll. Commissioner Bertrand. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Present. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Friend. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Alternate Myers. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. Here. And Commissioner Lowe. Here. Okay, uh, this is kind of a little unusual, but we're going to be going into closed session um, on uh, an anticipated uh, litigation. Um, do you have any idea of how long that might take, Mr. Preston? Uh, we think it's going to be very short. Okay, so we're going to re uh, recess to closed session, and then we will come back probably in, I would guess, 10 or 15 minutes. We will get return to address the regular agenda. Uh, item number three is oral communications. If there is any item that someone would like to speak on that is not on the agenda, uh, we would be, you please come up, or if you have to leave early, and this is the only time you can address an item on the agenda, please come forward. Morning, Commissioners. Michael Saint with uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I would just like to thank the RTC for um, inviting two of our reps to go to the um, Transit Corridor Alternatives an Analysis yesterday uh, as a focus group uh, at Simpkins. Um, it was, for me, a very positive experience. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank Doc, uh, Director Preston, Senior Planner Ginger Dykar and uh, Communications Specialist Shannon Munz for taking their time and making the effort to make it a really nice program. Um, also would like to thank uh, Steve Decker and his staff for their presentation. They did a very nice job. Um, I think if we all keep an open mind and keep the lines of communication open, we can really get a nice, wonderful transportation complex here on the corridor as well as uh, connections to other places in Santa Cruz. So more of these programs would be welcome and I also plan to attend next week's public meetings. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Terry <coughs> Pico, I have a presentation. And it's a continuation of what I did last meeting regarding the, the rail, trail, path alternative, bike path alternative. To. So the question is, this is, oh, that mic this. on? Mic is on, but I will have a hard time remembering how to do this thing. So this is, uh, last time there was an issue that went in response to what I brought up, said there's a safety issue, so I'll call this the safety edition. Why spend $11 million for a 1.2 mile segment if we have alternatives? Um, how do we do this? Hello? I'm sorry, this is not working, or is it? Okay, so why spend uh, $10.8 million when a better path exists? And if you remember this slide from before, the green line is the rail corridor. Uh, there's already an existing bike lane on West Beach, and there are already existing pedestrian paths along the neighborhoods and around the slough. And, uh, much, and both are used uh, relatively, especially the walking ways and, and the biking I use as well. So I'm one who will say that people do not use, will not use the rail corridor in that area anyway. So next, uh, just to review, this is the path of before we get there, the rail corridor is rerouted onto San Andreas and Beach Drive because you cannot get through not just the slough, it's not just going across the slough, there's a whole bunch of wetlands right along the rail corridor that will not allow the, the uh, addition of a, a bike path, rail path, 
I mean a bike pedestrian path. I want you to see that there, I'm going to refer to Far West Beach Drive and Near West Beach Drive. Far West is what I call you know, farm country, although it's still farm country, but that's in segment 17 area. That means that's the part that's in the detour part. And then near West Beach area, this is the part where, is where I say you should put the bike path. Go ahead, next. So I just want you to see on the reroute, the segment 17 Far West Beach area, the road itself is 26 feet paved. And if you try and go any farther, you have an irrigation ditch. Um, I didn't write it down because it gets confusing, but you do have 62 feet to work with when you do eventually r uh, make a bike path, but it's going to be more difficult than you think. There's 26 feet paved today. Next. Here's in the near West Beach area, uh, Lee Road and West Beach. I picked this on purpose so you could have a, a, a location, but this works all the way down West Beach Drive until the curve. It's 61 feet paved as it is. Okay, you don't need to do anything other than to put up bike lanes that are wider and protected. And if you need to go wider, you've got 92, 93 feet between property boundaries in this area and pretty much all the way through until the bend. And then you still have about 60 feet as well, 65 feet. Next. Um, back to the, the rail trail is an orphan detour, meaning you're already on West Beach Drive. You'll reroute it and you'll go back on West Beach Drive next. Uh, can you justify $11 million? Next. So I'm saying you should have protected bike uh, trails, uh, paths, which uh, are safe, and it would cost about uh, thirty dollars to $60,000, according to the federal government. Next. Uh, this is something we should be doing. I forgot to mention is we should be doing studies before we spend $11 million. Monterey Bay, Monterey County did that, and here's an example of their work. Next. And uh, there was also a thing of we spent money already, it delivered this drawing, next. That's actually what you see from that location. So the drawing and reality are very different, next. So is there a better way to spend money, next. Uh, improve the trails, you could do it for about half a million dollars, I'm not an expert on that. Next, uh, again, I mean, how many, could we're you? done, I'm done. Okay. So I just wanted to, okay. th that's it. I have a quick Thank question you. if I could. Go ahead. Have you uh, made this presentation or one like it to the Watsonville City Council? No. Could I suggest you might want to do that because in some level we're kind of being driven by what they've asked us to do. And this I didn't understand. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Mr. Caput? Uh, what I'd like to say. Well, I think if. Um, anyway, I'd like somebody okay, from the city to uh, answer some of the questions that he's brought up here. Okay, I think it'd be proper to, to talk to the city first. Uh, maybe we get something on the agenda with their council meeting, then they could come to us if necessary. And when you see someone, I would okay. like to have a name of a contact, Ms. Uh, Kaufman. Um, Chair, we, we did actually have Murray Fonts, and he has also responded to this in terms of what was favored by the city to go ahead and use the funds allocated, and the RFP has already been committed. But if there's any follow-up, Mr. Fonts, would you be able to follow up in any way there, please? Maybe you could just contact him and, and let... Uh, okay, I'm still saying $11 million dollars is more yeah, than let's, highway. Okay, we, we understand the situation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else would like to address us in oral communications? All right. Um, somebody coming. Oh. Somebody coming. We're glad to be in Watsonville. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to welcome you to Watsonville. Thank you very much for coming, and, uh, and, I, and I hope it was a nice, smooth trip on a beautiful spring day. But I hope you saw what was going on on the other side of the freeway. It's not a beautiful day for everybody that has to look in stalled traffic at taillights, idling cars. You know, we are a disadvantaged community despite this beautiful building and, and despite our beautiful weather. Every one of our metrics shows that we are disadvantaged. Disadvantaged educationally, disadvantaged job-wise, disadvantaged in every metric, including per capita income. So we need some help. 
We need your help. You see, the, migra the economic migration that goes on out of town every day on the freeway, we need some help. We need better land use planning. We need more resources. We need helpfulness. And so I ask you today to give us a hand. And, you know, after a meeting today, hang out in Watsonville. Go next door to Slice Pizza and have a, a gourmet, a boutique-type slice of Detroit or New York pizza. Um, go to some of our other fine establishments. Uh, there's, some, there's some major food providers, national brands in town, and lots of boutique stuff as well. And so buy, go to our car dealer and buy let's, uh, an electric... Let's stick with transportation issues. Car dealers are transportation, but... They are. <laughs> they are. They even got self-driving cars and electric cars yeah. now. So I say welcome to Watsonville. Remember our motto on the wall, opportunity through diversity, unity through cooperation. We ask for your cooperation and your help. Thank you. Thank you. Don't Thank confuse you, Detroit and New York pizza. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Would anybody else like to address us? Okay, we'll uh, go to the next item to, um, to look at additions or deletions uh, to the consent and regular agendas. Chair McPherson, um, I would like to um, move item 11 off a of consent and um, place that um, under 25. 25, or just past 25, we can call it 25-1 um, as a matter of order. Okay. We I also have um, some uh, additional materials. Uh, we have a handout for item 12, a handout for item 21, 24, 25, and a replacement page for item 26. Okay, so to be uh, item, we will move item number 11 to 25.1. <coughs> okay. Um, any other additions or deletions to consent or regular items? Mr. That's it. Mr. Chair, just a clarification. Mr. Preston, item 11, not item 8, just confirming that we're moving the correct item. I have item 11 as approved Highway 1, 41st SoCal Auxiliary okay. Lanes, PS&E. Are you? Oh, I, I she, correct. She, good, good. You're correct. Item 8. It, so to clarify, it's not item 11. Item number 8, approve Highway 1 State Park to Freedom Auxiliary yeah. Lanes and Bus and Shoulder. Cooperative agreement with Caltrans that will be moved to 25.1. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, friend, I was reading the wrong uh, item. Too many auxiliary lane projects. <laughs> Actually, not enough. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, we will move uh, to um, any other um, additions or deletions. Um, we'll move to the consent agenda. Does anybody um, have any item that they would like to pull on the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Friend. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just need to recuse myself from items number 9 and 10, which deal with the rail corridor. I have a financial conflict. My principal residence is within 500 feet of the rail line. Okay. Very good. Move the consent agenda. Second. As amended. Consent agenda has been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Um, okay, we will now move. Uh, Mr. Chair, just as a point of clarification, we didn't take public comment on the consent oh, agenda. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Is there any comment on the consent agenda items? Uh, if you were going to talk on item number eight, um, should wait till number 25. I'm not talking on number eight. <laughs> Hi, Sally Arnold, uh, board chair for Friends of the Rail and Trail. And um, I just want to say that we're really pleased about item number 12. Uh, that it looks like there are a number of new transit-related initiatives and funding sources available. Uh, I, I've, this quote really jumped out at me. Um, local rail services, $1.1 billion to locally sponsored project in Northern and Southern California that will improve local rail service and benefit high-speed rail when the system is connected to those areas. We hope that the RTC staff and the uh, Alternatives Analysis Consultant will review the governor's budget and identify specific programs and initiatives that could apply to future rail transit on, on our corridor. It seems like really good news, so I just want to, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of words in that consent agenda. I just want to really pull your attention to item 12 and say I think there's some good news in there for our county. Thank you. 
Any other pu public comments on the consent agenda? Sorry, that has been, we've approved that. We will now move on to the regular agenda. Uh, commissioner reports, any oral reports from commissioners? Mr. Ro uh, Rotkin. I just want to announce that this Saturday, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which is the, um, sorry, 8th of February, um, there will be the Democratic Women's Club of Santa Cruz County is doing a presentation on the rail corridor and presenting will be um, Ginger and Luis from our staff here, along with Friends of the Rail Trail, sort of talking about the, both the uh, vision of what's possible on that rail trail, but more specifically where we're at and what's going on in the planning and what opportunities the public have to weigh in on how that corridor is going to be used. That's open to the public and a free event. Thank you. Uh, Chair? Yes, Mr. Leopold. Uh, I also just want to say uh, thank you to the Friends of Rail and Trail, the City of Santa Cruz, and others who help uh, put on the groundbreaking uh, for the first portion of the rail trail in the City of Santa Cruz. It was a great celebration. I think there were over 200 people there. Um, uh, uh, former Congressman Sam Farr was there uh, taking a, a deserved victory lap about uh, this idea of having a trail that links the entire uh, Monterey Bay uh, together. Uh, and uh, there were lots of people who understood the significance of us uh, constructing the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, the rail trail, and it was a great way to, it was a great day to celebrate, and um, I appreciated the remarks from our executive director, uh, Guy Preston, uh, and the other speakers. Um, let's have more of these celebrations. Very good. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, I just want to thank the staff for working with us for the task force, uh, the workshop yesterday. Um, getting Watsonville to show up is a very difficult uh, project alone just to get enough people. We had an overwhelming response, and I would say it was almost standing room only. I think that we had probably the best attendance, which is cool, and a lot of people who are just starting to you know, feel that they need to have some say in the matter from this community about what to do with this particular corridor. So a lot of it was uh, patience with the education part of it, as well as really getting a good sense of what this community is asking for. And so I just want to thank the staff for um, helping us get that together and bringing the right team together for it. Thank you. Any other commissioners have comments, any reports? Okay, we we'll go to item number 21, um, the director's report, oral report. Thank you, Chair McPherson and commissioners. Um, uh, before I get started on my written report, um, I have a couple of additional things that I wanted to mention. Uh, I've been uh, informing the commission of my staffing changes, um, including our recent filling of a planner position. Um, Amanda Marino is here today, and I just wanted her uh, to welcome. stand up nice and you. give you an Thank opportunity you. to uh, say hello and welcome Amanda to our team. It's the last time we'll clap for you, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a lot of work to do here. <laughs> also, I wanted to uh, make note of the fact that um, the commission just uh, approved a couple of items, or actually three items, regarding work on uh, the the rail line. Um, industrial rail is going to be performing some erosion control work. They're also going to be doing some work on uh, our bridges, um, maintaining the walkways. Um, putting up no trespassing signs. And then uh, previously you had um, authorized uh, industrial rail to, to uh, bring the tracks up to uh, class one standards between Capitola and uh, uh, the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, that work is uh, expected to be starting shortly as well. So you will see, be seeing some activity on the rail line if people are asking questions. Um, this is all work that you guys have authorized, and I think everybody has been uh, anticipating to start seeing some, some preservation of the railway t taking place. Um, additionally, I wanted to thank the commissioners that provided us assistance with uh, nominees for the E&D TAC. Uh, we have eight new members of the E&D TAC. Uh, that was also um, on our consent agenda, and, and I think that's a uh, 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 because of the work that, that you guys did in helping us to fill some, some very difficult positions. So thank you for that. Uh, moving on, uh, the transit corridor alternatives analysis, and some of the public members have spoken to this already, but it is underway. We had several workshops earlier this week. 
um, the, T the uh, TCAA, as we're calling it, um, will evaluate public transmit, transit investment options that provide an integrated transit network for Santa Cruz County, utilizing all or part of the length of the railway as a dedicated transit facility. There will be two open houses for the transit corridor analysis uh, to solicit input on milestone one, which is goals, screening criteria, and performance measures, and the initial list of alternatives. Locations and times of the open houses are Tuesday, February 11th, uh, um, from 6 to 7.30 at the Live Oak Grange, and then also on Wednesday, February 12th, from 6 to 7.30 at the Watsonville Library Community Room. The uh, State Transportation Improvement Plan hearing um, was last week, and I was in Sacramento to um, uh, talk about um, the projects that uh, you have authorized me to move forward with and program STIP funding. And for uh, this uh, STIP cycle, we are programming funding for the Highway 1, 41st Avenue to Soquel Avenue Auxiliary Lane, Bus on Shoulder, and Chanticleer Avenue Bike Pedestrian Bridge Project. This is the type of project that the Commission is really looking for. It was also very um, satisfying for me to um, be able to address the Commission and let them know that um, I have received unanimous support from this Commission with respect to the Unified Corridor Study, and which included this project. Um, there's a lot of projects that are going to be brought forward for uh, solutions to congested corridor funding, and to be able to show um, support from the Commission is um, very important in terms of ensuring that we get those grant opportunities in the future. Um, Central Coast Coalition Day is having what it's called a legislative day, um, and that's going to occur um, uh, on February 19th, and Chair McPherson and Vice Chair Con uh, Gonzalez will join me in representing the RTC in Sacramento. Um, we uh, plan this trip on meeting with key department heads, including the State uh, Transportation Agency, Caltrans, the Air Resources Board, the California Transportation Commission, and uh, potentially the governor's office. Uh, I know it's the same day as the State of the State address, so it may be a little bit challenging with the governor's office. We had an opportunity to meet with them last year, um, but uh, they've always been uh, very receptive to, to the Central Coast Coalition, which is uh, um, uh, Santa Cruz County, San Benito, Monterey, uh, um, San Luis Obispo, uh, and Santa Barbara County, our TPAs as well as AMBAG, and uh, we represent uh, uh, a very unique part of the state and have a lot of real common goals and uh, power to numbers coming and speaking together carries a lot of weight with uh, these, these agencies as well as our elected officials. Uh, that concludes my director's report. Okay, any questions from or, okay, Commission. Okay, we'll move on to item 22, the Cal uh, Trans report. Eileen Mill. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. I'd like to give you a little bit of insight into our new director, Toks Omishakan, who came to California uh, as the director in October. Um, he he is making his way around the state to introduce himself to folks, and he has established five priorities that he has for the department. These will sound familiar, but I want to kind of emphasize uh, some of the focus that he's providing to us. Uh, safety. Uh, every day, 10 people die on California's transportation system, and two of these are pedestrians or bicyclists. He wants us to engage more in the engineering, education, and enforcement uh, um, factors to, to bring these down and work toward the uh, goal of achieving zero deaths. Multimodalism. The director is asking us to, to continue to focus on many different modes, giving people options. We have, we have people moving on uh, managed lanes, transit, taking transit, <coughs> bicycling, walking, and we have a lot of freight that moves around the country. But we're going to be seeing, uh, according to the Public Policy Institute of California, we're, we're preparing for an increase of population in, in the state of 25%. Um, over the next 30 years, and we're s expecting to see an increase in freight movement by 75 percent. So it's a tall order. Efficiencies. Of course, of course, he wants to see the department run in an efficient way, and he's asking us to continue to look for ways that we can um, economize and be good stewards of the, of the public's dollars. Innovation and creativity. Understanding that Caltrans is nearly a 100-year-old department, we can't just rely on doing things um, the way we've always done things. 
um, however, knowing that people rely on a, um, a sturdy and reliable transportation system, he wants us to continue looking at how we can help uh, not only uh, keep people moving, but to work with our partners, um, our local agency partners on addressing societal issues such as the homelessness crisis um, and uh, helping folks find transformative ways to address these problems. Uh, the fifth priority is community and stakeholder engagement. The director would like to see Caltrans be more out in the community, talking with neighborhoods, community groups, uh, and local governments directly, um, as opposed to having people come to us. So he'd like to see us. Um, he'd like to see us out in the community more. I want to touch on uh, one of the references to the the um, housing crisis and the homelessness crisis. The governor also signed executive, uh, I probably mentioned this a, a couple weeks ago, the new executive order uh, by the governor. And Caltrans is looking at uh, different properties that we own that are considered to be part of the right of way but may not be needed in the very near term for transportation facilities, but finding ways to make arrangements with local governments to lease those properties to help uh, on a temporary basis. And also coming up with a lease template that local agencies can use in other areas as well for um, low cost, um, you know, transitional housing type situations. So you'll hear on more, more on that in the coming weeks and months. Uh, your project information is up to date, although um, the one favorite project I know uh, Commissioner Caput is interested in and others is the um, pedestrian crossing um, safety project. It says it begins construction in February, but I think we're still on, we've moved that out to April. It just didn't get captured here. But it's coming. Any questions? Yes. Sure. Yes, thank you. Um, I was pleased to hear that the new director is concerned about, um, more concerned about pedestrian dangers and uh, pedestrian safety. And I hope that those words get translated into action by Caltrans in terms of the project in Davenport that would. Uh, the county is working on and the commission is involved in that's going to uh, increase traffic safety across Highway 1. I mean, that's, you know, the, the key decision. The, the money has been allocated, the plans are being drawn, and the project could be carried out in a fairly expeditious way if Caltrans staff will uh, translate those words into action. So I really hope that, that there will be that follow through. Thank you. <laughs> I did have one, one follow-up I neglected. Uh, there was the question about the zero emission vehicles used for the paratransit. Uh, and that was brought forward um, by one of your constituents here. And uh, he was able to locate a prototype vehicle or a vehicle that is um, available for the, this was the uh, 5310 program that Community Bridges was applying for. And uh, it's not certain yet whether those, so the type of vehicles, um, uh, that are zero emission and the smaller scale, the cutaways, we don't know yet if they're available uh, under the federal programming requirements for Buy America and different things they have to be certified for participation in the federal program. So there, there's progress, uh, there's progress, uh, but not sure how it will influence this particular application. But I appreciate you bringing that forward. Uh, I just want to th uh, say thank you uh, for your attention to uh, you know, all of these different places in the district that you have to watch out for. And uh, your office has been very responsive, and I just want to thank you publicly. I, you know, I would like to say the same thing on Highway 9 where we had that, uh, that fatality uh, a while back. And uh, there is still some adjustment. We've made an alternate route uh, allowed for that, but there might be further adjustments on that uh, Highway uh, nine entrance coming into Felton from the, the north. Um, that'll be coming, I think, to us in the near future. Some possible recommendations for how we might make that safer for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, any other questions? Yes, Mr. Um, with the under underpass for uh, wildlife, is there going to be a presentation to the public to explain what that works about? You know, normally you're dealing with public safety, but this is a different kind of issue. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand, we did hold uh, public meetings when we were in the environmental document phase. That's right. Um, if there's um, opportunity to bring more information again forward, 
um, at the next milestone or something, we certainly can do that. I don't know if, if, whether a public meeting is necessary, but maybe we can get more information out there. Or yeah, just information to the public so they understand the intent uh, other than, you know, preview to the start of the project. Yes. Yeah, sure. and I'm sure the land trust also has a lo lots of information about it. Any other comments from Okay. We will move to uh, item number 23, presentation from the City of Watson Village, where we call in oral communications, uh, um, or um, I think it was the uh, consent agenda. There was some discussion. We moved this just to get a specific um, presentation from Watsonville. This is going to be a Watsonville decision in, gen in general, but not the RTC, but we'd like to hear what you have to say about um, this, this issue. Commission. My name is Murray Fonts. I'm a principal engineer with the Public Works Department of the City of Watsonville. I appreciate the opportunity to present to the Commission transportation projects going on in the City of Watsonville. Commission staff did contact me prior to today and asked if I could discuss further the issue that came up during oral communications, and so I'll include that in my presentation. Okay. This image shows some murals that are on the front of the city building across the street. The city of Watsonville was the first city in Santa Cruz County to adopt Vision Zero, and these murals are traffic safety related. They're done by local muralists, Peter Bartzak, Aubrey Osorio, Priscilla Martinez, and Angelina Osorio. We hope you'll take a look at them on your way out today after you get your designer pizza. <laughs> the city of Watsonville has numerous trails already existing and takes great pride in the development of that trail system and it's been done in partnership with Watsonville Wetlands Watch. Earlier this week on Saturday, February 2nd, the City and Wetlands Watch hosted World Wetlands Day on the Upper Struve Slough, where 400 people gathered and planted over 1,000 plants as well as 16 trees in celebration of Wetlands Day and in an effort to continue to restore this precious resource that the city has. Watsonville has three highways that pass through it. Highway 1 skirts the southwest boundary. Highway 152 goes through the heart of Watsonville and is named Main Street in portions of it. And then Highway 129 goes along the southeastern boundary. The city has three projects that they're coordinating with Caltrans to develop at this time. Two of them are planning grants. One which was adopted by city council last, late last year as a planning grant for a downtown complete streets plan. With this document, the city will be able to identify and implement and obtain funding for safety projects and projects that will enhance the opportunities for all segments of the population, pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit riders. A second planning grant, which will go to council for approval later this month, is a complete streets to school grant. The city has partnered with Pajaro Valley Unified School District to look at 15 different campuses within the city and identify ways that pedestrian and bicycle improvements can be implemented to en encourage students to walk and ride and to live a healthier lifestyle. And then as I mentioned, the city of Watsonville is a vision zero city and later this month an action plan will be presented to council for adoption. Watsonville has some principal arterial roads that it's been investing funding in, in replacing and reconstructing, Airport Boulevard, Freedom Boulevard, and Green Valley Road. And there are a number of projects that have either been completed or are underway with the assistance of funding secured through the Regional Transportation Commission. Completed in 2019, was a project on Airport Boulevard. It cost approximately $2.2 million. Oops. It's in the upper left corner. It extends from the highway to Hangar Way. It included road reconstruction, installing sidewalks where none existed, 
and enhancing pedestrian and bicycle facilities, including flashing beacon installation. A second project that was completed late last year was on Green Valley Road. This project reconstructed the roadway and provided sidewalks where none existed. The total cost was $1.4 million. The city received just under $800,000 in STBG funds as well as over $300,000 in RSTPX funds. Upcoming projects include a small one on Airport Boulevard. If you look at the picture in the lower left-hand corner, you'll appreciate why we're paying attention to this. It's one of our best alligator roads, if I can use that term. We anticipate it would cost $700,000 to, re to reconstruct and we'll be using SB1 and gas tax funds. Another project on Green Valley Road uses Measure D funds and will be built in the coming year. It will go from Green Valley Road to city limits and involve pedestrian, bike, and roadway improvements. And then additional work is scheduled for Green Valley Road extending from Alta Vista, excuse me, for Freedom Boulevard, extending from Alta Vista to Green Valley Road. The city secured $1.55 million in STIP funds through the RTC and construction is anticipated in 2022. The city is also using SDBG funds secured through the RTC to do a plan line study for the balance of Freedom Boulevard from Green Valley to the city limits in order to set up future projects for construction. The city has a number of pedestrian and bicycle projects that are taking place. We recently completed a green lanes project where for the first time in the city of Watsonville, green lanes have been added to our bicycle facilities. These were done throughout the city in numerous corridors. The city is also moving ahead with the construction of a segment of the rail trail, segment 18. It will be constructed in two phases. The initial phase, a contract has been awarded for construction. It is a segment 1,600 feet long between Ohlone Parkway and Watsonville Slough Trail Trailhead. The balance of the project, phase two, would be done in two years after the city secures CPUC support on some rail crossings. The, excuse me, the bike project received $325,000 in STIP funding. The rail trail project secured $600,000 in ATP Cycle 2 funding. With the assistance of Rachel Morconi of the RTC staff, I went to the CTC meeting late last year to request and receive that funding. The CTC supported the project as proposed, as well as some additional projects, which I'll report on shortly. The city is also using $600,000 in Measure D funds and 200,000, excuse me, $600,000 in SDPX funds and to a $200,000 land trust donation to assist with construction of that segment of the trail. The city has an ATP Cycle 3 grant to do safety improvements on Lincoln Street near the high school. A $660,000 grant was secured and then the city is working with Caltrans to construct a bicycle pedestrian bridge across the highway on Harkinsu Road including $900,000 in STIP funds. The upper left-hand corner shows an image of the green lanes with Commissioner Gonzalez riding his bike on it, as well as Gina Cole, the uh, Santa Cruz County <coughs> bike group leader. The lower left-hand corner shows the portion of Lincoln Street that's proposed for safety improvements in front of Watsonville High School. The idea is to make it a bit safer for youth who are crossing and not have conflicts with cars. And then the Slough Trail Network map is shown on the right. As you can see, Watsonville has an extensive network of trails that crisscross throughout the city along the sloughs. This slide shows a network of trails that are all part of the overall vision that the city has for South County trails. Oops. The red line is the rail trail segment. It begins at Walker Street and ends at Lee Road. 
The blue line picking up on the left side of the rail trail is Lee Road, and it heads up to Harkin Slough Road. The city currently has a, conserva a California conservation, uh, forgive me, the city has a grant through the state to do the design and environmental documentation work on this. We anticipate it being done at the end of this year and then moving toward construction and securing funding. That would link up with the land trust property owned in that area, the Watsonville Slough Farms. We're partnering with the land trust in a sense to create a, um, a way for people to get out there from Watsonville. And then the pedestrian bike bridge project that I mentioned earlier that would cross the Highway 1 on Harkinsu Road is the third leg of these three projects that would create a loop. It would allow alternative access for high school students to Pajaro Valley High School. It would provide pedestrian and bicycles access to some of the more beautiful slough areas that, are lim that have limited access at this time. We're excited for the work we're doing, and these are some of the projects that we're partnering locally with the Land Trust, with Watsonville Wetlands Watch, and others. Addressing the, the questions about why we're moving ahead with Rail Trail Segment 18. This was the slide that I received from the F January RTC meeting. It shows, an ex the yellow shows an existing trail that circulates through the neighborhoods along, Watson, along Watsonville Slough. It also shows in green the proposed rail trail from the trailhead to Lee Road, and then it shows Beach Street where there are existing bike lanes that parallel the two other trail segments. I recreated that drawing on a larger map. So there you see the existing trail network with the yellow dashes and the proposed rail trail segment that was shown in the previous slide in green. The rail trail project for segment 18 goes to Walker Street. So I've extended the green line farther to the right where it would link up with Walker Street. That is the end of segment 18. It also connects with existing bicycle and pedestrian facilities that access the heart of downtown Watsonville. And by heart, I'm referring to the Metro Center and the city plaza. So we, we are anxious to see a pedestrian bike trail that gets closer to the, the downtown area. I extended the broken line on the right to take in what is existing sidewalk. If we were to connect to the trail network on Watsonville Slough, we would need to follow that circuitous route because it's the one with continuous existing sidewalk. And then on the left at the lower end, there's some solid yellow line. Those areas don't have existing facilities that the city owns. There's either no sidewalk in that area or we don't have control over the existing pathways there. So a parallel route to the proposed segment 18 would follow what is shown in yellow using existing facilities and still requiring some acquisition. In a recent cost estimate, to do this work would be $9.1 million. The city's estimate coincides with what the RTC had projected. We used the recent bid information that we received on our phase one construction contract, as well as work we're doing with consultants. So to parallel the rail trail, it would be necessary to install more sidewalk because it doesn't exist now in certain areas. I didn't generate a cost of what it would take to build a sidewalk going down Beach Street to link up with the existing trail, but it would be necessary to go from Walker Street at least to Ohlone Parkway or to construct sidewalk along Walker Street to connect the intersection of Walker and Beach to the existing sidewalk. The city saw the opportunity to develop a trail in a corridor that doesn't have existing driveways, that doesn't have conflicts with existing uses and neighbors, and pursued that in constructing the rail trail. 
This slide shows the city's 2012 Watsonville Trails Master Plan. The city adopted this in 2012. Currently, the city has approximately 10 miles, excuse me, 12 miles of trail. But as you can see, it's an ambitious plan with over 33 miles proposed. A lot of those trails, as you can see in this image that shows a closer view of the area under consideration <coughs> by the rail trail, there are a lot of looped systems. As we go up and down the sloughs, as we go between neighborhoods, when the city adopted this in 2012, it was two years prior to the adoption of the, of the rail trail master plan. Understanding that the rail trail would be proposed eventually, the city incorporated into its plan. It was supported by the council members in 2012. We recognize that it's duplicative in some ways, but as you see in our trail network, that's okay with us. Loops are good things for trail walkers. Not everyone goes from point A to point B. Some people come out and they want to walk a mile loop. They want to walk a three mile loop. And so they want to come back. So we're comfortable with paralleling the existing system. This is a page out of the 2014 trails, rail trail master plan. And I show it to indicate that not only does it propose the rail trail in, in the rail corridor, but it also recognizes using Beach Street as a bicycle and pedestrian facility as well that would extend out to Pajaro Dunes in the beach. The master plan itself proposes parallel systems. So the city has chosen to implement these two plans by starting with the rail trail. In time, we hope to have the resources to circle back and improve Beach Street to provide those facilities as well. We hope that in time, those would link up with improvements on Beach Street on the county segment so that there would be improved bike and pet access in that area. Watsonville also has used funding secured through the RTC for bicycle and pedestrian safety programs and outreach. We've contracted with Ecology Action to provide bike and walk smart training in local elementary schools. We've contracted with Bike Santa Cruz County to do the earn a bike program at Pajaro Valley High School. It's unique if you ever get a chance to see it. Not only do they provide youth with a chance to earn a bike, uh, middle school students, but they also have high school students acting as mentors, teaching them safety, health, and how to work on their bikes. And if you look on the, le the lower left and right photos, you'll see a bike that Bike Santa Cruz County has created that if you pedal it, it powers it can either be a blender and you can make smoothies or you can do spin art. <laughs> Watsonville has also secured funding for some traffic safety projects, including an adaptive traffic control system on Green Valley Road that's in the process of being installed using funding from the Air Pollution Control District, as well as HSIP funding to build a signal at Airport and Home Road. This slide shows projects that the city has that would be linked with Santa Cruz County. I, I presented this slide last year. I'm pleased to say that we've begun to partner with the county on two projects. We've reached out to the Public Works Department and have been working on the Harkins Sioux Road Bridge as well as the Lee Road Trail. And finally, I'd like to invite you to Watsonville's 17th Annual Egg Drop Competition hosted by the Watsonville Engineering Department. It'll be on February 19th. We'll be throwing eggs off the parking structure here next door into the alleyway. We invite not only the public, but we've reached out to the library and the environmental science workshop. We usually have 50 to 60 kids who have built devices, some of them artistic in nature, others more practical. We drop them off the building, we see if they survive, and we celebrate. So come on out. It's an exceptional activity. <laughs> Scrambled eggs for lunch. <laughs> oh. I've never told that yoke before. <laughs>
And as I like to do, the final slide is a view of one of Watsonville Slough's many trails. We invite you to come and check them out. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for that comprehensive report. Um, it's uh, truly impressive, the aggressive plan that Watsonville has uh, undertaken. And uh, I, I congratulate the city of Watsonville for taking this aggressive stance. And uh, this is much more than we discussed last month, as I said coming in. But I also wanted to say, before I get some comments from uh, the commissioners or the public, that. Uh, I want to I want to thank the land trust for its cooperative efforts and uh, involvement in, in this, and then the, for the voters again, who uh, approved Measure D in uh, uh, November of 2016. Uh, many of these projects wouldn't be happening without either of those uh, participants. So, but congratulations to Watsonville. And any co comments from? Yes, Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, um, sort of a section of your trail system. Not yet. You'll have more. Okay. Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm very proud about the 2012 adoption of the 33 miles. The 33 miles also is complementary to 850 acres of slough that has been reclaimed in our community. We've had more sloughs in the reclamation than we've had in the 60s. So this is very complementary for the loop, adaptive loop system, as well as the birding festivals and a lot of other um, eco-friendly tourism um, projects associated with this and adoption to getting to and from um, not only recreational use, the parks, and um, a lot of the different subdivisions going in to have access to this. So thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, the gentleman that was commenting about this has left, so I'm hoping that we let him know that there's a link on the, uh, the taping of this that he can come back to for some of the answers that he has there, or some of the answers to the questions that he has. Um, so I, again, I'm very complimentary to all of the work and efforts that the city's put forward um, to make sure that this is a very wholesome and healthy community. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. Well, thank you, Mary. <clears throat> thank you, Mary, for that comprehensive information. Uh, hopefully you'll give us one like that, the city council. So creating it would engender discussion with property owners about how their access may be limited. That was one reason the city looked at the rail trail corridor as an opportunity to continue to allow businesses to function as they are and address the need for pedestrian facilities. Yeah, and the other point that the gentleman points out that it's only going to be a bike-only trail, but I don't think we're going to have a police officer monitoring the trail is saying that you can't walk on this trail or bicyclists, you know, pushing pedestrians off the trail at the same time. And I think it's going to be a more safe route overall for uh, bicyclists and pedestrians to be on. You're correct. It's not a bike only trail. It's a trail for bicyclists and pedestrians. While there are existing trails that parallel it for bicycles and pedestrians, it's being built 12 feet wide. It will accommodate bikes and peds who work together, traveling in both directions. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, co comments from the public? I'd like to address us on this. Oh, come on, if you. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I just wanted to say that we're really excited about seeing the segment 18 uh, section uh, 
going to construction really soon. And um, Mr. Fonce and I were speaking earlier. We're really excited about some, you know, helping with some kind of groundbreaking party and celebration here in Watsonville because the community really needs to see that this is moving forward and it's going to be a positive thing for the community. And it's going to link eventually it's going to link our whole county together, which is going to be really important. So thank you very much for your support of this project. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. I was just noticing all the slides and stuff with the water and all the sloughs there. I was wondering if there was any, maybe this gentleman can answer, any study uh, for future um, sea level rise issues with these types of projects so close to the beach. And uh, had any mitigation type things gone on with the planning portion of this. Thank you. The city is working with consultants on sea level rise for the public improvements that are proposed, some specific to the projects, including this trail. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, we will move on to um, item number 24, amendment to the Measure D e expenditure plan. Mr. Preston. Thank you, Chair McPherson and Commissioners. Um, today I bring forward an item to, for your consideration regarding a potential amendment to the e Measure D e expenditure plan. On November 8th, uh, 2016, the voter of Santa Cruz County approved the Measure D e ordinance enacting a retail transaction and use tax dedicated to making transportation improvements. Um, this uh, was a significant achievement for uh, the County of Santa Cruz as it brought a local dedicated uh, uh, funding source to the county, which uh, enables us to um, leverage additional funding. When the ordinance was drafted and passed, uh, state and federal funding sources available to improve, maintain, and operate the the uh, uh, state highway system had dramatically decreased and become increasingly, increasingly unreliable. I think you all remember the debates that the gas tax hadn't been raised in years and that our funds were drying up. Um, staff relief, a, um, the, the ex Staff uh, released a draft Measure D strategic implementation plan for public review on December 20th, 2019 as the authority for um, implementing the, the uh, Measure D sales tax measure. Um, we held a public hearing at our last uh, RTC meeting and at that meeting there were several public comments related to um, the uh, strategic implementation plan and the inclusion of two auxiliary lane projects as part of the plan. The Measure D expenditure plan provided for 25% of revenues to be allocated to Highway 1 and Highway 17 corridor projects to increase the safety and efficiency of these corridors in Santa Cruz County. The highway corridor investment category of the expenditure plan states that the highway investments included in the expenditure plan improve traffic flow and safety on Highway 1, especially for South County and Mid-County commuters, small businesses, bus riders, and first responders by adding auxiliary lanes between three interchanges, and they listed 41st Avenue to Soquel Drive, Bay Porter Avenue to Porter State Park Avenue, and State Park um, Drive to Park Avenue. Auxiliary lanes are identified as lower cost highway projects that can improve flow by separating entering or exiting traffic from the through lanes and can help improve the safety on this high traffic volume corridor. The highway corridor investment category of the expenditure plan also states that programs that reduce fatal injury collisions on highways and reduce congestion are also funded by measure revenues. The expenditure plan provides example programs that improve safety and reduce congestion, including the Safe on 17 Task Force and the Freeway Service Patrol programs. Section 25 of the ordinance states that this ordinance may be amended to provide for the use of additional federal, state, and local revenues to account for unexpected revenues or to take into consideration unforeseen circumstances. The ordinance 
and expenditure plan may only be amended if required by the following process set forth in section 180207 of the Public Utilities Code. One, <coughs> initiation of amendments by the authority reciting findings of necessity. Two, provisions of notice and a copy of amendments provided to the Board of Supervisors and the City Councils in Santa Cruz County. And three, the proposed amendments shall become effective 45 days after notice is given. Initiation and approval of amendments required a two-thirds <coughs> vote of the total membership of the authority. There is also a significant section nine regarding leveraging funds. Um, this was uh, apparently very important to the drafters of this ordinance and encouraged the uh, RTC and uh, its um, jur local jurisdictions to leverage funds whenever possible. When the ordinance was written and adopted by the voters, there was limited and unreliable state and federal funding sources. But in 2017, after Measure D passed, the California State Legislature passed and the governor signed Senate Bill 1, also known as the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, increasing transportation funding by an estimated $52.4 billion over the next 10 years, and that will continue in perpetuity. Senate Bill 1 includes an estimated $250 million per year for projects that will improve traffic flow and mobility along the state's most congested routes through their Solutions to Congested Corridor Program. SB 1 also includes an estimated $200 million per year as matching funds to local agencies with voter-approved transportation tax measures through the Local Partnership Program. Consistent with the Public Utilities Code, Section 180207, these two SB1 grant programs represent additional funds and are also an unforeseen circumstance that significantly expanded the leveraging capacity of Measure D revenues, especially for the type of improvements contemplated by the Highway Corridor Investment category of the expenditure plan. In 2018, the Monterey Salinas Transit and Santa Cruz Metro Transit Districts completed a project report and feasibility <coughs> study of <coughs> bus on shoulders operations on State <coughs> Route 1 and the Monterey Branch Line, identifying a hybrid auxiliary lane bus on shoulder project on State Route 1 between Morrissey Boulevard and Freedom Boulevard interchanges as a sustainable and cost-effective way to provide meaningful benefits to transit riders in the corridor. There were also included in that feasibility other um, alternatives for bus on shoulder operations. The alternative that is often referenced in public comment is an alternative to use only the shoulder and not the hybrid model. The, that, that was looked at in the feasibility as an interim solution only. It was not for the full length of the corridor because of several pinch points on the corridor. And um, in discussions with the CHP and Caltrans, they only liked and seemed willing to approve a hybrid model auxiliary lane bus on shoulder project. When I first looked at the types of investments that this agency was considering, and I saw bus on shoulders, having worked for Caltrans for many years, I understood how challenging it would be to get their approval for anything that is not typical Caltrans. At first, I wasn't sure that this program would be able to succeed. When I came on board and I saw the work that was being done and the cooperation between the CHP and Caltrans for the hybrid bus on shoulder <coughs> project, I knew that this was something that could work. On May 23, 2019, the RTC completed a report for the State Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus on Shoulder concept of operations, which rep represents a hybrid auxiliary lane bus on shoulder facility extending from Morrissey Boulevard to Freedom Boulevard. Caltrans and the CHP have both supported this project and were participated in the concept of operations report. The guidelines for Senate Bill 1, Solutions to Congested Corridor Program and um, Local Partnership Program competitive grants are extremely favorable towards projects that are multimodal and innovative. 
the hybrid auxiliary lane bus on shoulder corridor project fits well within these guidelines and is likely to receive grant funding in the next two rounds of cycles. Um, I am very schedule driven and I'm very much looking at ways to um, help deliver the Measure D program. I've looked at the guidelines very closely and based on the guidelines that are provided, it is very important to get started on these projects as early as possible. They've only indicated that they will um, award funding for the construction phase of the project. So if we don't get started on environmental clearance, there is no way that these projects will ever get funded by these competitive programs. I anticipate that the first three sets of auxiliary lanes could potentially be funded in the most current round, and those guidelines were released um, just last, uh, were actually were approved last week by the CTC meeting um, in Sacramento. And um, there was considerable interest in the Bus on Shoulders project as a multimodal project. When I, also when I first took this job, I received a lot of, um, a lot of encouragement to listen to a, a presentation that was made by Jared Walker. Jared Walker is a, a leader in transportation and an advocate for transit. Jared pointed out um, a very key location um, in Santa Cruz County that we needed to consider if we were ever to solve our transportation problems. He referred to that location as the Aptos Strangler. It's really just a choke point or a bottleneck, as someone might call it, but is the most significant problem for transportation in this corridor. It is where our three parallel routes that you studied as part of the Unified Corridor Study all come together. It's where Highway 1, the rail, and Soquel Drive all meet. It is a two-lane facility, Soquel Drive, a four-lane freeway, Highway 1, and a rail line that we're still studying as to what to do. If we don't solve the problem at this location, we will not solve the congestion problems. One of the other things about this project um, from Freedom Drive uh, to State Park is that we have no shoulders in a significant portion of this um, area. This is the location wa where the buses would not be able to ride on the shoulders unless we did significant improvements. It's also a significant opportunity especially considering that our multimodal investment plan in Measure D wanted us to consider not only highway corridor improvements, but improvements on the rail line, improvements on our, um, our uh, bike facilities. Um, all of these problems can be addressed by, extend by um, modifying the um, uh, expenditure plan to include two additional, additional sets of auxiliary lanes as we would have to replace the railroad bridges over the highway in order to accomplish this goal. This is a significant opportunity to increase transit and bicycle access at the same time as improving highway traffic. We couldn't be set up better to compete for these programs than we are, but it requires us to work a little bit harder and move the ball forward. Staff recommends that the Regional Transportation Commission adopt by resolution findings of necessity and initiate and propose the first amendment to the Measure D expenditure plan to be effective 45 days after notice of the first amendment is provided as required by Public Utilities Code Section 810207. And I am, um, I, I have to, um, <coughs> bring to your attention a couple of administrative mistakes. Um, with all the work we've done on this, you would think that this wouldn't slip by, but it did. <laughs> In um, Exhibit A, Amendment 1 to the Santa Cruz County 2016 Measure D Transportation Improvement Expenditure Plan, there was a slight error in the listing of the Highway 1 uh, corridor um, auxiliary lanes to be added, where it states Rio del Mar to State Park and Freedom to State Park. It should say Freedom to Rio del Mar. That mistake was carried forward into the resolution. 
So on page 24-7 under item two, resolution should be corrected to state Freedom Boulevard to Rio Del Mar. On page 24-8, it should be amended under item four, but at the top of 24-8 also to Freedom Boulevard to Rio Del Mar Boulevard. And then also on page 24-11, under Highway 1 corridor at the bottom of the page, again, it should state Rio Del Mar Boulevard to State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard to Rio Del Mar Boulevard. Um, it's also on page 24-9, I stated that earlier, again, Rio Del Mar to State Park, Freedom to Rio <coughs> Del Mar. With that, I hand it over to you to consider staff's recommendation. We have, uh, any comments from commissioners, uh, Mr. Johnson? Thank you, Chair. So for, our, for people who aren't um, exactly <coughs> sure of, of our uh, terminology, uh, you use the term hybrid bus on shoulder. Could you define that? So the hybrid model um, is, since we are building auxiliary lanes between interchanges, and auxiliary lanes are lanes that go from the exit, uh, from, from the entrance point of one interchange to the exit point of the other, there'd, there'd be an auxiliary lane or a lane that um, would increase the merging distance. Um, the hybrid model for bus on shoulders, there would actually be a shoulder next to the auxiliary lane, but the buses would ride in the auxiliary lanes in that location. So having an additional shoulder would still provide a location for CHP to, to pull people over without blocking that auxiliary lane, without blocking the location where the buses are traveling. So it provides a safer facility and that's why Caltrans and CHP supported the hybrid model. It still is a bus on shoulder project because um, at the intersection locations, that auxiliary lane drops, which is why it's not a capacity increasing project and it would actually ride on the shoulders under the interchanges. So that's the hybrid model. And so and the um, th thoroughfare uh, at the exit and uh, entrance onto the freeway would go through um, for the buses, is that? Only for, only for the buses. Right. And that's why it, you're increasing the capacity for transit, but you're really not increasing the capacity for the, the private vehicle. Thank you. Mr. Rotkin. So I have, I just want to confirm something I think you said in your presentation, that the funding for this extension of the auxiliary lanes past what was uh, advertised when we were doing Measure D um, is not going to take money from the other, we, we allot, to go back with a comment, we allotted categories, certain percentages for each of five different buckets of things we were going to do. Um, and you're, if I understand, I want to make sure that your statement is that we're not taking money from any of the other buckets in order to add this additional auxiliary hybrid project with the bus on shoulder. Yes, that's 100% accurate. The 25% highway corridor project um, is for projects um, only on the highway system. It was limited to Highway 1 and Highway 17. Um, it did have the additional language in there for safety projects, um, for um, um, you know increasing congestion, and that's why um, you know it could be um, um, argue that you don't need to amend the plan, but it's certainly clear since uh, three were listed to add, add the additional two. The bus on shoulders is, uh, is a way to in, uh, increase the <coughs> transit times, um, but if we explicitly state it, it um, <coughs> just makes it clearer and more transparent, and that's, I think, what, what the, the public asked us to do at the last meeting. And then secondly, to confirm, in your professional judgment, you think there's more money available for this hybrid project than were we to try and, go, you know, simply ex make the extension south of um, Park State Park <coughs> Drive um, for a bus on shoulder, but without the uh, auxiliary capacity for some for the automobiles? Well, they're going to look real closely at our performance measures, and they're going to look at our projects both individually and as a corridor. And if you leave a section that has your choke point on there unimproved, you're really just um, providing a very small facility with minor amounts of improvement. You're really not going to see the level of improvement for a bus on shoulder project until you get past the choke point. Third point, so make sure I understand the comments you're making. If this project would have to fund the railroad bridges being replaced, 
That also offers an, offers an opportunity for improvement on the rail and trail that would pass over those railroad bridges as well as what it does on the Highway 1. I actually think this is one of the biggest opportunities of this, um, of, of this project. Um, yes, because those two bridges represent choke points, they need to be replaced in order to, to widen the highway. Um, the Caltrans EIR for this <coughs> section of the roadway um, did say when, uh, when we do replace the bridges that they would be done in a way to accommodate bicycle and pedestrian uh, uh, traffic. Um, so we are considering doing that. And, and it, it makes this project um, more competitive because the programs, and you know, as, as uh, Director Lowe mentioned earlier, um, there's been a new emphasis on multimodal projects. Um, being able to show that um, we could um, increase bicycle access is um, very important and will make this project more competitive. Um, it also um, makes it more permittable. Um, when uh, we met with the Coastal Commission yesterday and we talked about this project, um, they're very concerned with um, um, making sure that um, additional development in the area provides additional coastal access. By providing that coastal ac access as part of this project, um, I think we make the Coastal Commission happy and, and make it more likely that we'll be able to get uh, a coastal development permit for this project. Um, it also takes a lot of uh, funding um, um, pressure off of the rail trail project because if we go forward with this project as part of the highway project and we apply for this competitive grant, we could potentially get those projects funded and I wouldn't have to use the other funding from the active transportation program to replace or provide access over the freeway. So it, it's really a win-win-win for, um, for the commission when you take a, a full look at it in terms of the multimodal components and uh, the ability to bring additional funding and actually deliver projects to the county. And my final question, for the dreamers among us, and I'm one of them, um, who imagined someday we would actually reduce the use of the private automobile rather than you know, accommodate growing demands, um, to what extent is this project feasible for at some point, and wouldn't be in the near future, but at some point banning automobiles on this auxiliary lane and turning it into a true bus on lane, you know, bus throughway in effect that, that's not uh, competing with cars for moving ahead quickly down the highway. Is that any, something that prohibits that from a possibility if in fact we find ourselves with less demand for the, right now, the people that want to have the highway widened would kill us if we did it, but I'm talking about sometime in the future when there's a clear sense that there's a real alternative for people in public transit and they don't need to take their car. I am not aware of anything that would prevent you from turning it into a transit only lane. I think um, it's a Caltrans facility, they would have ultimate say on it, but I don't think there's anything in the streets and highway code that would prevent you from doing that in the future. Um, I, I do think that for now, um, we want to reduce the, the cut through um, traffic through neighborhoods, so providing a certain amount of um, congestion relief to vehicles, um, but not providing through lanes would allow us to do that. Um, we cannot turn these lanes into through lanes. Um, that, that part of it is, is, has been made very clear to us. So it can't go the other way, but I, I don't know definitively the answer to your question, but I could look into it more. I'd be interested in knowing more okay. and, and any, as you, if you could research that and give us a better sense about it. Thank you. I'm sorry it took so much time. That's fine. That's just, uh, we're going to have a few more comments, I think. You might be able to clarify. Kaufman Gomez. Oh, excuse Let's, me. Oh. Oh, I, I might just be able to clarify. I would look into it to, to validate this, but... My sense is that the cost benefit would change drastically if you made it only for high occupancy. If you had auxiliary lanes that were only available to high occupancy, you may not get the benefit out of it, and so the cost um, may not justify the improvement. Um, so, again, I think it's something that you have to kind of test over time, but I, I would think that that could be a risk. Good. Thank you. Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. This is a bit more procedural on the report that we have here. And it says that um, copy of the <coughs> amendments provided to the Board of Supervisors and the City Councils in Santa Cruz County. Does this mean a presentation or does this mean that we're just showing them that this has been approved by this body one way or voted on by this body? So, uh, will this information be shared or presented to each of these councils? My intent was to just send a letter um, and attach the amendment. That's how I've seen it done for other jurisdictions. 
Um, if the city of uh, Watsonville is interested in a presentation, please reach out to me. And then in the, the queue of things, this is at the bottom of the queue, so as funding comes available, we're working these other projects all the way down the queue, so we're always going to be looking at adding to that as we need these projects going forward. Would that be about right, or is this going to, this isn't going to change or, or alter what queue we've got in place for this adoption, that this takes precedent over what we've already have the plans to do um, and have been approved on already? That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Leopold. Uh, just a quick question. Something that you said just uh, was uh, very interesting to me about the auxiliary lanes and the question about transit, wh whether they could be turned one way but not the other. Um, and you said that these auxiliary lanes couldn't become throughput lanes. Could you just explain a little bit w more about why that's the case? When funding is used for a certain purpose on a project, and, I, and Director Lowe may be able to help me on that, there's there's restrictions on being able to then change the use on it. So um, that's one reason why. The other reason why is, is pure geometry. Um, you'd have to reconstruct a, a significant portion of interchanges just to make it work. Um, Really, anything that is done in the future for increasing capacity would require a separate environmental impact report or CEQA clearance of some sort. Um, and so we simply cannot just change these lanes into to three lanes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bertrand? A number of things have been addressed by other commissioners. Last comment from uh, uh, Kaufman Gomez. Um, I think Capitola would be very interested in a presentation on these improvements anticipated. And I look at this as an overall efficiency, you know, tying the whole system together in a better sense all the way down to freedom is an efficiency effort in my mind. Would you comment on that? I mean, to me, it makes the whole system work better. It does. And, and I think when you, when you look at more than one problem in the same solution, you're able to accomplish so much more. And I remember some of the questions that you've asked me in the past about some of the things we did up in Sonoma and how we got them done. I think our biggest successes is when we saw um, um, points of common interest. I mean, where the spaces of one project impact spaces of another project. And um, the additional set of auxiliary lanes that are being contemplated um, identifies such a point. And so when we're able to address those all at once, we avoid throwaway cost, uh, we can build everything all at one time, and we can address multiple needs. It's the most efficient way of, of delivering projects. Thank you. Okay, comments from the public? Good morning, commissioners. My name is Rick Longinati, and I have a couple slides I want to show here. <clears throat> um, I just want to say that uh, I think there's another win-win uh, option for you today. Um, you're about to amend Measure D expenditure plan, and that gives you a wide open field to consider. And I would recommend that. Thank you. Uh, well, first let me uh, say once again, uh, for those of you who may not be remembering what was in the EIR, the the, the proposal before you today has a, a resolution which is actually inaccurate because it's, it suggests that congestion relief could be obtained by auxiliary lanes. That's not true according to the EIR. So there's no factual basis on which to say that auxiliary lanes will reduce congestion. There's no factual basis on, on which to say that it will increase safety because the EIR says, you know, the accident rates overall and by each segment. Uh, would be the same as the accident rates in the in uh, the no build alternative. So there's no basis to vote for this um, other than let's see. <coughs> Ryan for here. Can you advance the slide for me? Okay. Oh, so so this slide shows that there's a 25% increase projected by Caltrans if you build the auxiliary lanes and the ramp metering from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. So what do we get for, the, for our 25% increase? We get no improvement in congestion, and, or very slight is, is their terminology, and no improvement in safety. Next slide, please. 
So the only argument for it is to help the bus. Uh, the upper photo you see is from the Twin Cities area where they have 300 miles of bus on shoulder lanes. We don't, they, don't, they didn't need to be build auxiliary lanes before they built their bus on shoulder. It's a bus only lane on the shoulder of the road. And as our Metro report uh, gave us, the, it said we could do the same here before the auxiliary lanes are built. We could build an auxiliary lane or a bus only lane on the shoulder of the road. Now, the win-win that I think that you ought to go for is fixing the choke point in Aptos, fixing the Aptos Strangler. Yes, replace those bridges down there, but put a bus-only lane next to the through lanes of traffic. If you put an auxiliary lane, which is in combination with a bus-only lane, not only will you get a bus stuck in auxiliary lanes, such as what I've showed in this bottom uh, photo, but you'll get 25% more greenhouse gases if we do it that way. So this seems to me a, a, a simple question for you. You know, what kind of legacy do you want to leave? Do you want to increase greenhouse gases by 25%? Or can we get people in buses that really work? Look at that photo from the Twin Cities. You know, there are two buses using that auxiliary lane. We can really get people. I'll give you, I'll give you another minute. Okay, go ahead. Um, that's it, it's, 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 really, it's really simple. Um, but I, I don't suppose that you're prepared right now to, uh, to, to say, oh well, yeah, let's do this amendment for Measure D, but do a bus only lane through that Aptos Strangler. I don't suppose you're ready for that because you haven't even seen the bus on shoulder feasibility study. So I would take that as a first step is to invite staff to present that study to you. Thank you. Okay, any other public comments? Uh, Michael Saint, once again, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I agree, with, of course, with all Rick has to say here. Um, and I also agree with Director um, Preston on the Aptos Strangler and how it needs to be addressed. I think I've talked about that several times in the past couple of years. Um, I think we just disagree on what should be done, basically. We're really very close on our ideas and our goals of trying to relieve congestion and make things safer. We also try to follow the EIRs that all of you have gone over and Caltrans has presented, and they're just not. The EIRs, like Rick said, is not agreeing with some of the things that Director Preston says. And we're always talking about mode shift. That seems to be one of the things we emphasize a lot. Um, but the Oxlane project induces our citizens to continue using Highway 1 and basically single occupancy vehicles. Um, so why would anybody shift their mode of transportation if you start to relieve congestion for a few years? Um, and it's just like Rick says, it's just quite simple. We want the same thing. The only additional thing we think that would save you a lot of money and do the job of much better is have a dedicated bus on shoulder. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Mr. Hurst? Or wait, go ahead, sir, come on up. Yeah. <clears throat> Craig Chatterton, District 2. So this is a pretty, if I understand it correctly, this is a pretty significant change from what we were talking about last year when the uh, preferred scenario basically said we can't afford to widen uh, those those bridges. So I, I think it's really impressive that we're coming to a, maybe a different conclusion. But at the same time, from a public standpoint, it seems like this is a very significant change in how people maybe react, perceive, and, and there's lots of controversy on whether we should do it or not and whether it'll, it'll provide the benefits we need. But it seems like we're talking about, you know, I didn't see the actual numbers here, but many hundreds of thousands of dollars expended. I don't irrespective of where the money's coming from. Millions. To do the, what? Not hundreds of thousands. But, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And, and yet the public is not really engaged in the same way they were in terms of passing Measure D. Um, and Measure D promised us reduced congestion, and that's not really being realized, even with these changes per se. Uh, it just seems to me that, although I believe that this may be part of the right answer, uh, it needs to be more supported and endorsed through some public process as opposed to just doing an amendment uh, in a meeting and then off going proceeding and the public decides or, or hears that, oh, we added a, you know, we widened the bridges, we added a lane, but you don't get to use it. Maybe that's the right answer. Maybe the public would support it, but I think a lot of people will be surprised based on everything that's happened since 2016. So this seems like the right direction, but maybe the wrong process. 
that makes any sense. Thank you. Good morning again, Lowell Hurst from the west side, the west side of Watsonville. I'm in support of uh, staff's recommendations and the uh, great idea that uh, auxiliary lanes can help. They've already been proved uh, in the north part of the county. And so I have a dream as well. I have a dream about transportation justice for the workforce of Watsonville and allowing them to get to work and come home to work and be with their families as well. And so know of my support for the good actions that are taking place here. Thank you. Anyone else like to address us from the public? We'll close the public segment of the hearing. Uh, Mr. Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks for the staff report and for the public testimony. Let me first say and make clear that what the commission is considering here is not approving this auxiliary lane project. It's simply amending the um, Measure D to allow for the project to go forward through the process. And while I don't particularly, th I sort of don't think amendment is needed, I certainly will support the amendment. But I think it's important to remember that the commission has also, I think, already approved doing an environmental impact report on this segment which will have to be done before it could e ever receive funding, which is a public process. And so there will be opportunities to, um, for the public to weigh in on the desirability and feasibility of the project. Moreover, uh, one of the requirements of an EIR is that alternatives be considered. And I'm sure that one of the alternatives that will be considered to the auxiliary lane plus bus on shoulder will be a bus on shoulder only option. So I think the commission, before it does make a final decision on um, whether to move forward with this project or not, will have information about the potential environmental effects of this <coughs> project um, as well as alternatives. So I'm in support of uh, the staff recommendation and would be prepared to make a motion to approve it if it's, this is the appropriate time to do that. Back to you. I think there's more, a couple more comments. Mr. Bertrand, did you have? Um, I'm interested in the study also because the issue here of safety is something that seems to be very important to our uh, Department of um, Transportation as you know, helping, helping this funding going. So this will be answered by that. Anyone else would like to? Mr. Friend? Uh, I appreciate Commissioner Schifrin's comments. I just want to say that I think that, that should this move forward, this has the potential to be one of the single largest benefits for mid and south county residents that has occurred from this commission in the last 30 to 40 years the commission in, in large part has helped create the problem i think the commission has a unique responsibility and opportunity to help alleviate this problem through transportation improvements such as eliminating the choke point in aptos but also investing in the south county the solution isn't only on the transportation side there's a housing jobs and balance that those of us that work as elected officials have a different responsibility to address. But from a transportation solution, uh, it's clear that the voters, when they approved in 2016 Measure D, wanted a multimodal option to alleviate traffic throughout the county, not just one portion of the county, throughout the county. They voted on a very specific percentage allocation that included highway widening. At the time, this commission discussed whether or not it would extend beyond State Park. And the discussion at that time wasn't a lack of interest for it. It was a concern whether we had the funding to be able to do it and whether we could then say to the community that we could actually deliver on the projects because the most important thing was deliverance. As time has gone on with the new executive director, as shared also, by the way, today by Caltrans, it's been shown that these are projects that could theoretically be delivered. I mean, the commission, had it had known that information at the time, clearly would have just have added this in uh, to the plan at the time because it was something that we had discussed when we were negotiating this initial deal. So it harmonizes not just with voter intent but commission intent. Um, I, I don't think that this, uh, but moving forward, I think that this, should the commission be presented with this opportunity to actually extend this beyond, I, I, I'm confident that uh, you'll have near universal mid and south county support for saying uh, bring back my quality of life, bring back safety, and bring back options so it's not an hour-long commute uh, for those 18 miles each way. 
Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So um, echoing what uh, Commissioner Friend just said, I, I, I think it's so important to kind of keep the fidelity that we had with the voters who voted on Measure D. You know, the expectation was that there was going to be uh, some improvements to the highway. And, you know, one of the reasons why I think um, our executive director got hired in, in, our, in our, the process was his experience to be nimble and to embrace uh, opportunities. Uh, and, you know, when opportunities come along, such as SB1, when you can access funds that had not previously been anticipated, that's an opportunity that we should say, let's look into it. Let's, 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 let's find ways to, to make something like this happen. Because you mentioned, our, uh, uh, Mr. Preston mentioned that this is a win, win, win. And um, I can't really think of much better opportunities than that uh, for us to move forward. So, um, you know, we have a motion here. Uh, obviously, it's something that I'm 100% I'm behind. So I'll make the motion to approve the staff recommendation. Second. Uh, so moved by Schiffer and second by Friend. There's a couple more comments. One of Mr. <laughs> Gonzalez. <laughs> yeah. We'll all that, get on that's this. quick shooting there. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, it, it, this is an, an amendment, uh, and it's an important amendment. Uh, this is actually opening up what the uh, city of Watsonville really needs uh, and the people that are commuting from Watsonville or Las Lomas um, to Santa Cruz to, to work. Uh, so we're, we're taking a big step and we're taking the right step in making the amendment. Um, and of course, we still got to look at all the alternatives, but I think the hybrid uh, auxiliary lanes is going to be functional. And so with that, I'll... Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we, we have 100,000 cars taking on Highway 1 right now. And we know 30 years there was supposed to be a 25% population increase. So the comment that I keep hearing is that it makes a slight modification. That slight modification exponentially is a huge modification. And so when we do the, the math on that, we're, we're making a, a, a huge improvement of what we're doing here as the primary source of where our workers are traveling. And that all projects, you're always looking for the next project to put on the back of the queue. And this is just that opportunity for us just to look at the vision beyond the, just the window of the five-year or the 10-year plan about what our, our systems are that we're going to be investing in. So we will always continue to be looking forward with those projects as we complete them, as we see if we can combine them, as if we can leverage them. So that's why, in the formality sake, that this is being asked for of this body representing all of the districts and all of the districts that voted two thirds for the D. So I'm very much in support of looking at those projects that we can bring to fruition, help offer the relief that we have. When it takes an hour and 25 minutes to get the 17 miles from Watsonville, it's just crazy that we aren't doing this in the bottleneck is a prim primary location of where the emphasis needs to take place in terms of the improvements. We hear about the GHG uh, and it, we will not be able to relieve a GHG with a continued bottleneck of working around the epicenter of where the problem is. And this gives the ability to work through that process. It gives us the opportunity for the studies and the whole process to take place in terms of the, the public input, the, the professionals coming in here, what consultants, of course, we're going to be hiring and the re reports and reviews that we'll be continuing to do. But it gives the ability of what D intention is about to uh, help the county move and put another project on there that will allevi alleviate this um, bottleneck. And um, so I, I also support this. Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Y you know, uh, when we passed Measure D, we did make a commitment to the community. And uh, it meant that uh, projects that weren't uh, uh, my highest priority but were someone else's hi highest priority could move forward. And that multimodal um, everyone win scenario was successful for us to actually pass a measure. Um, <clears throat> when I look at this, uh, I also remember that when Measure D was passed, we didn't know about SB1, right? I mean, that, I didn't know. I, I, I've been to Sacramento. There was no idea that 2017 was going to be the year that it passed. Uh, it was introduced to only a couple months later, but it was... It, you know, there had been lots of unsuccessful efforts. Um, in 2016, in November 2016, we also 
hadn't done all the work on the bus on shoulder. We didn't know if that was going to work. Um, so uh, what we, to me, it's important to honor what we told people as part of that effort. Um, and um, I think, uh, I, I find some agreement with uh, Mr. Longinati in terms of how successful we are going to be in reducing congestion. That's true. Um, because of induced travel, other issues. But I also think that we, all, we are committed here to this multimodal effort for the bus on shoulder. That could be, that could be very helpful. Um, we're gonna, we, we are unanimously committed to uh, transit on our rail corridor. That's going to help as well. Um, that's a dedicated lane for transit. That's, that's going to help us um, achieve our goals of moving people quickly uh, throughout our community. So what I like uh, about this is we're not spending uh, any other money from the initiative on things that we didn't tell people we were going to do. I mean, in the, in the sense that we aren't pulling money for this effort from another one of the buckets. We are, in effect, spreading thin the uh, money that we had committed for the highway in the anticipation that it might bring in more money. But it's a risk. There's no guarantee. We, we, we're putting a lot of, of uh, weight on uh, the director's shoulders. Um, uh, and he, he might be right. He might not. But we, so we're taking the same pot of money and we're th spreading it thinner on the highway portion. There's a risk with that. We should acknowledge that risk. Um, will there be benefits if we, if we can uh, do the bus on shoulder effectively uh, through um, the, the name that Aptos doesn't want to be remembered by? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, we will have made a difference. Um, and it, as my colleague mentioned, it has to do with full environmental review. We have to look at the impacts. We're going to make the, the changes. I'm also, I was, I was glad to hear that we can't turn lanes into something they're not now in the future. These auxiliary lanes are, are not the, the, uh, the, the camel uh, nose under the tent, right? Um, we can make them uh, restricted to transit, but we can't go the other way and make them the through lanes. Uh, that's a disappointment, I'm sure, to some of my colleagues. Uh, so when I look at that balance of all those pieces, I'm going to support uh, this uh, recommendation uh, because I think it does move us forward and it gives us a chance to look at all the things and, and allow us to, to complete the bus on shoulder uh, project, which will be first in the state to do. And uh, it, it, uh, if we can leverage these monies for not only the highway, but for the rail corridor um, to improve uh, and a widely acknowledged choke point by all sides, that's, that's a win for the community. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Mr. Rotkin. I've been a supporter of bus on shoulder for about 25 years, in public for about 25 years now, and I'm excited at the prospect that we actually could be <coughs> moving significantly towards it. But I want to take a moment to appreciate the comments from the audience about, that, that put the question of climate change front and center. I think those are really critical questions. This is a very complex issue that's in front of us, and trying to balance how do you best deliver the projects that actually in the end may result in people getting around in ways that are less destructive to the planet and to at least to our, our existence on the planet, I think is important. So I want to appreciate those comments. I assume that when we get to the discussion of the environmental work on this, that uh, there will be another opportunity for a full public, dis that to me is critical, that there be a full public discussion. I think people do need to understand the somewhat limited um, reality of congestion relief that we're facing here. I, I, don't, I think there's some people that think, you know, if we do this, they'll just be able to you know, flow down Highway 1. It's just not going to work that way. I appreciate also the comment that it won't be that much worse with 25 percent more people on the highway, or really in the community, that are gonna, not necessarily on the highway. But uh, to me, trying to figure out how to balance the big picture questions about climate change with the actual practical decisions about 
How do you improve transportation options? It's, a diff it's complex and difficult, and I want to appreciate that there are people that are pushing us to look at that question in terms of what has to be the central question there, how we you know, do something about the greenhouse gas effects of all the decisions that we're making here. Mr. Caput, everybody wants to say something. Okay, Mr. Caput. <laughs> okay. I guess uh, with, uh, with everything we're looking at here, if we could just keep the traffic moving, uh, between here in Santa Cruz or Santa Cruz to Watsonville, um, if, if in the bad areas, if we if we have the traffic moving at 25 miles an hour, as long as it's moving at 25 miles an hour, I believe that we would cut the commute time uh, in half. When we're talking about the bad areas, it's that stop go stop go uh, between. Uh, Marmonte and uh, um, State Park Drive, uh, that, that just kills the uh, commute time right there. So <coughs> if, <coughs> if we can keep the traffic moving <coughs> with either the auxiliary lanes or the bus only lane or whatever, uh, we, we can cut that down about half. I, I believe I'm correct on that. and. Um, the other would be, of course, metering lights. Metering lights do help. I don't know exactly where in the plan uh, the metering lights would be, but uh, they've been proven to actually improve traffic also. So I, I don't know if you can make a little comment on that. It's the accordion effect of stopping, then going, and then stopping and going that's causing all this backup. So yeah, the, the according effect is real. Um, it's usually caused by uh, vehicles entering and exiting the highway, and that's why auxiliary lanes will, um, will help that problem. Um, um, with respect to uh, the metering lights, um, they're not included as part of this project. Um, we considered to, you know, whether we could. Um, it does require um, uh, reconstruction of the, intersection, the interchanges and ramps in order to be able to do that. You have to have enough storage capacity. Otherwise, um, you put a stoplight on the on-ramp and suddenly your surface streets are all backed up with the traffic um, uh, extending into those locations. So um, it is something that is uh, included in the programmatic EIR for Highway 1. It is something that we can consider as um, additional improvements for the highway in the future, but they're not um, currently being included in the uh, hybrid auxiliary lane bus and shoulder project. And I, I guess Caltrans would be part of that also, a metering lights later. Absolutely. And the local, uh, local entities as well because of the, you know, the concerns over traffic backing up on their streets. Right. And one last comment is uh, it seems to me coming back from Santa Cruz at uh, commute time, we're, we're talking about commute time, by the way. Uh, there's other times where the traffic is moving very well. But uh, coming back, th the worst spot is uh, from Morrissey to SoCal Avenue. Uh, that uh, that's worse than the actually going from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, and that's because of where the auxiliary lanes end right now. Right, and so as you continue them on, you you move the bottleneck or the choke point further to the south, and that's why it's important to go far enough south to um, not just move the bottleneck from one uh, location to another, but to eliminate it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, um, that last comment is definitely true in terms of the SoCal Morrissey. Um, I just want to recognize the gentleman who spoke about our process and that, um, you know, we weren't on scrutiny. Um, measure D, there was a lot of scrutiny, and this is a change of Measure D. And so I appreciate you coming and talking about your sense of whether we're actually following the correct process. Um, in support of our director, I read the notes that he provided us, and he not only provided um, details according to the process that we have to follow as to why he felt this was a decent amendment. So I support that. But also in general, I'd like to recognize that comments from the citizens that come here are a very important part of this process. I believe that, and I know personally, that everyone on this commission appreciates the public involvement and the comments that are very thoughtful often and very helpful for us to make our decision. 
So I'd like to recognize the individual that came and talked to us, to us about our process. Okay. Ms. Brown, did you have some comments? Yeah, uh, thank you. Is this on? I don't know how to turn it on. Can you hear me? You're yes. Welcome. Okay, Sorry. thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to just make a quick comment uh, acknowledging the members of the public who have been speaking up and continue to uh, communicate with us via email and showing up here uh, to talk about the, <coughs> um, the realities of human-induced climate change, primarily due to greenhouse gas emissions. I believe that um, you know, young people understand this. They're telling us uh, loudly and clearly that um, they don't want business as usual. And what we are doing here is really voting uh, to continue to deliver the status quo. It, it is a frustration of mine. Um, you know, a lot of this, I believe, is about perception of uh, the potential for traffic relief that um, we are unlikely to get. So I, I agree with uh, the members of the public who have spoken up about that, and some of my colleagues have also acknowledged. Um, I also uh, understand that this is, you know, we're making a decision about the about Santa Cruz County as a, you know, regional transportation network. Uh, I understand that uh, the voters were clear about what they wa wanted to, what they would, were willing to support with their tax dollars. Um, and I do believe that uh, we have another opportunity with uh, environmental review to consider um, with more information available to us, uh, the potential uh, cost benefit and, and what the, um, the, you know, the data tells us in that regard may, may change uh, the direction we take. Um, so I did want to just say that it's, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to support uh, moving forward in this way, but I also understand that this is something that um, the community has spoken about and my colleagues here have also um, spoken on, and so I'll leave it there. And, but thank you all for um, sharing your perspectives. Yeah. I just think it's curious. Why, you know, it's we're we're moving east, to, uh, west to east. Why do we say f always from freedom to state park and not state park to freedom? And that's just is that something? Uh, just this bugs me. <laughs> that that was one of the problems I had, and why I had to make that correction here today. Um, we're building them in one direction: uh, Caltrans stations projects from south to north, um, and from uh, west to east. So they, um, it's a nomenclature or a style that has been adopted by the State Department of Transportation and kind of carried forward in how they uh, printed on all of their documents. And so as to not reverse things, SIP. Thank, thank you, Chair McPherson. Once again, that's my item. Um, uh, again, it's on Measure D, and uh, the Measure D ordinance um, uh, has a requirement that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, in his role as the Measure D authority, shall allocate, administer, and oversee the expenditure of all measure revenues which are not directly allocated by formula annually to other agencies through an implementation plan, which it will update every five years following a public hearing. Approximately 53% of the expenditure plan is not directly allocated by formula to other entities. The Measure D strategic implementation plan, or, or the draft of it, was released for public review on Friday, December 20th. A public hearing was held on January 16th. Additional public comments received on the SIP by 12 o'clock uh, on January 28th have been included as attachment three, 
and comments received by noon um, uh, on February 5th um, have been distributed as handouts. Staff has made uh, minor revisions to the draft 2020 Measure D strategic implementation plan based on the input and comments received from members of the public, RTC commissioners, RTC committees, public inter interest groups, and partner agencies. Revisions were also made to improve clarity, syntax, and formatting. Uh, the day after I presented the strategic implementation plan, I went to Sacramento for yet another meeting um, with uh, state officials that were developing the um, guidelines for uh, SB1 uh, state and local uh, state local partnership program and the solutions to congested corridor program. At that meeting, they changed uh, their guidelines from requiring that environmental review be complete by the time the uh, commission take action to, uh, to state that uh, um, environmental clearance would need to be obtained within six months of uh, that action. That uh, put a big smile on my face because it made another one of our projects eligible this round for funding, and that was the, uh, the state park to uh, uh, Bay Porter project. Um, we thought we would not be able to apply for that uh, for that project in uh, this round of funding, and it now made it eligible. It's almost as if uh, somebody was speaking to us and telling us to hurry up and get this thing done. So uh, we made that uh, revision to the, the, the strategic implementation plan, and that was uh, posted on our website. Uh, one late comment kind of came in from uh, the city manager for the city of Santa Cruz, uh, Assistant Public Works Director Chris Schneider, asked it, that um, some language be changed or modified or considered uh, to be changed for our um, project delivery management process. Um, I agreed to make those changes. It's provided as a handout today. Um, uh, it was done in the spirit of partnership. Uh, um, the city of Santa Cruz has been a wonderful partner in the development of projects on the uh, Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line um, for the uh, uh, Coastal Rail, rail Trail. And um, um, uh, Mr. Schneider and I agreed that um, it was in our mutual benefit to provide um, some minor revisions to ensure that we had a strong working relationship built on partnership. So those changes were also made. So, um, and with that stated and those changes noted, staff recommends that the Regional Transportation Commission adopt by resolution the 2020 Measure D stra Strategic Implementation Plan and to direct staff to seek opportunities to leverage Measure D funds for state and federal funds to expedite deliverables for Measure D regional investments. Thank you. Uh, comments from the commissioner? Comments, comments from the public? Rule. I'll second. And moved by Mr. Rotkin, okay. second by Kaufman Gomez. I just, I just oh. wanted to make one remark. Sure. I, the, uh, the more and more that I look at the strategic plan, the better I feel about what the future looks like for these projects. And as I go out, uh, I've been spending a lot of time talking to, to uh, members of the community, talking about transportation, and the strategic plan does prove incredibly useful in saying how we're going to accomplish what we set out to. And I, I appreciate the work that goes into it. And these uh, changes make a lot of sense to me. And I support the, the effort. Mr. Schiffer. <clears throat> Not to contradict my colleague, um, I also support the staff recommendation. But I think we really have to look at the strategic plan for what it is, which is a document that's going to keep changing because it's really a function, it's gonna be driven by the out, outside grants that we're able to get. And it's, this tells us where we are at a point in time. But as we've seen with some projects so far, um, the ability to get outside grants so that we're just leveraging the Measure D money is gonna be critical in really carrying out the projects in all the different categories that are in uh, we're in the measure. So um, I, I think it's important that we do it. We sort of have to do it. I think it is helpful, as Commissioner Leopold says, in terms of explaining to the public what's, um, what's anticipated. But really, just keeping in mind that this is, this is a document that's going to be changing, I would guess, on an annual basis as um, we learn about grant opportunities and are able to um, uh, uh, obtain them. So again, I support the recommendation 
because this is where we are now. Right. I, I agree. Uh, Measure D, we, a lot of us worked on it for years to just get the right language on the ballot, ballot as a multimodal program. Uh, it was very inclusive, which everybody obviously wanted, or there's certainly two thirds, more than two thirds of the voters, but it does complicate some things and, you know, your, your plan and how things might move from one year to the next, uh, particularly in the state. But uh, I, I really, uh, just, uh, it is complicated, but it's uh, inclusive, and that's why it passed by such a good margin, I think. Um, any other comments? Okay, we have a motion. All those on uh, item number 25, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Now we will go back to item uh, number eight, which is now 25.1, Highway 1 State Park Freedom <coughs> Auxiliary. Uh, bus on shoulder cooperative agreement with Caltrans, and I'm very appreciative. It, it says State Park to Freedom, so you can move ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I move the staff recommendation. Second. Second. Yes, any comments? Uh, public comment? Um, yeah, I just want to mention that in cooperating with Caltrans, we should get clearer from them about their policy on bus on shoulder. Um, you may recall that Mark Stone carried legislation that allowed Monterey County and Santa Cruz County to develop bus on shoulder. Uh, Monterey County has already funded their bus on shoulder. It does not include auxiliary lanes. It's a bus on the shoulder and it's in its only lane. So the notion that Caltrans would not approve uh, a bus only lane on the shoulder of the road is something that I think you need clarified. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? Uh, here's a mo. Oh. oh. Motion on the floor. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Uh, item number 26, the 2045 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan Goals, Policies, and Targets. Brianna Goodman. Good morning, Commissioners. Brianna Goodman of your staff. Today I am requesting your approval of the draft goals, policies, and targets for the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan. They're in your packet as attachment one, page 26-5. Regional Transportation Plan identifies transportation needs for Santa Cruz County over the next 20 plus years and is required for certain types of funding. An RTP is completed every four years. There was an RTP completed in 2014, 2018, and we are now working on the 2022 update referred to as the 2045 RTP for the horizon year of 2045. The goals, policies, and targets in Attachment 1 form the foundation of the policy element of the RTP. There was a significant update in the 2014 RTP policy element to incorporate the triple bottom line of equity, environment, and economy as the basis for the goals, policies, and targets. The Santa Cruz County RTP is incorporated into the federally mandated Metropolitan Transportation Plan and the state mandated Sustainable Community Strategies, otherwise known as the MTP SCS, that is prepared by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. The draft goals, policies, and targets were revised from the 2040 RTP goals to shift their function from forecasting based on the constrained project list to monitoring trends in real time in order to measure the progress towards the RTP goals. Performance measures were also revised based on federal requirements from the FAST Act for Caltrans and Metropolitan Transportation Agencies to report on the performance of their transportation systems. Although RTC is not required to report the performance of these measures, the 2045 RTP performance measures and targets were revised to be consistent with this legislation. Throughout our recent process, several policies were also added to reflect increased focus on, at the state level on goods movement, transportation system security, transportation system resiliency in the face of climate change. These are policies 1.7, 2.5, and 3.6 of attachment one. After feedback from the RTC advisory committees and the public, the project team also modified several targets, including modifying safety targets to align with vision zero and increasing separated bicycle facility and active commute targets. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from Commission? Questions from the public? Okay, and I uh, just want to point out that. Someone coming. Oh, excuse me. Uh, go ahead. You can come up, sir. Uh, just that these are due um, for uh, to the RTC staff by April 1st. So go ahead, sir. 
Craig Chatterton, uh, District 2. So again, I may not fully understand things, but this was scary to me. The original, if I'm correct and in my understanding, the original um, document had things like increasing the percentage of people that could travel to key destinations within 20 minutes, 30 minutes or whatever. Metrics that the public could actually look at and say, is RTC, are, are the supervisors doing good things for us? Now it simply says that they're going to monitor these trends. There's no specific targets. Now maybe those are somewhere else, but as a, as a resident and a voter, this scares me because you're, you're basically, it's almost as like the RTC is saying, we don't know what's going to happen, so we can't commit to anything, so we're taking these out of, the, out of our metrics. So how does a voter measure you guys in your success? You're going to spend hundreds of millions, billions of dollars on this. Are we going to get anything for that? If all we're doing is monitoring the changes, I don't see how we can hold you accountable for that. So that, unless I'm missing something, that kind of scares me. Uh, that, the key that phrase, shifting from forecasting to monitoring. So where's the accountability? Maybe it's somewhere else, but I don't see it. Um, and another comment was that, uh, well, yeah, it seems like the RTC is kind of admitting that they really don't know what's going to happen, and they can't measure it, so they're going to not try, even not even try. And that, that's scary to me. I wanted to make another comment, uh, if I could, just quickly, uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Bertram's comment about the process that I raised earlier. The process, I'm sure, follows the book. It's very explicit. You're following all the regulations. But as a layman, it's very hard to figure out what's going on. And I may turn to something like Santa Cruz Local. They can summarize one of these meetings in 10 minutes and tell me what I need to know and what's important and what's not. And I can spend three hours in one of these meetings and read all the 150-page do documents ahead of time and not know what's going on. So it's, 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 it's kind of like, uh, from a layman's standpoint, what are the things that I should be paying attention to as a citizen? How do I figure out you know, when to come to these meetings and, and what's important to me? Okay. It's just really hard to figure out. So, Thank you. Uh, Michael Saint, the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. <clears throat> I just wanted to make a couple comments about some of the wording. Uh, agenda 26, page 2, under <coughs> Uh, <coughs> policy element. Uh, they talk about a triple bottom line concept of sustainability. Uh, I would just like to uh, point out that you missed the most important part of the definition of sustainability in that uh, summary. <coughs> uh, what needs to be added to that uh, is without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's sustainability and that's not included in that comment. Um, an example of that would be the breakdown of the ox lanes, which is forecast by Caltrans EIR in 2035. That's future generation. Um, one other one, I was wondering if I can get a clarification maybe from um, uh, Ginger on this. Um, we we're talking about vehicle miles traveled. And according to the 2040 um, report, which, the, you know, is five years earlier, it says that the VMT has decreased. This is all compared to the 2005 vehicle miles traveled. They're starting at that point. It has decreased by 7% compared to 2005 by the year 2015. So we've already reduced 7%. Uh, if that trend continues, there will be a 15% reduction by 2020, which is this year. Uh, I'm not sure that has happened, but that was the forecast from the 2040 VMT or the um, RTP. So if you look at the present one, the new one is for 2045 and is only requiring a 4% decrease by 2030 and a 10% by 2045. So I think you're already there. I mean, you're going to forecast, four, am I correct on this or am I missing something? It's 14% by 2045 now, and it's <coughs> forecasted to be 15% by 20, 2020. So basically for the next 15 years or 25 years, we're not gonna do anything with vehicle miles traveled. We're actually gonna lose a percent. Um, I may be wrong in that interpretation, but I think that's how I understand it. Also, the tier one uh, project will add 29% vehicle miles traveled 
if we proceed with that project. Uh, so my estimate would be, are we going to dump this project just so we don't increase VMT? Um, my suggestion that it'd be a good idea. Um, and that's basically all I have to do. And again, if you want mode shift, y you don't widen highways to induce more demand. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Bring it back to the board. Yes, Mr. Schiffer. Yes, I would want to clarify with staff uh, the public comment regarding forecasting versus monitoring. Um, the concern seemed to be with holding the whether the the commission would be accountable for achieving its goals or uh, at least trying to achieve its goals. And, and I, my understanding about what that change um, is about is. It's changing the method of determining whether the goals are being met or not. And it, said, it says shift from forecasting to monitoring in real time in order to measure the progress towards meeting the RTP goals. So it's not like we're not going to have goals and we're not going to be measuring whether we meet them. It's just, it, and it seems to me the change makes sense because we will be getting information along the way, which means monitoring in real time. So we'll know how well we're doing in terms of meeting our goals rather than just sort of generalizing, trying to figure out what the future is going to hold. So if in fact, uh, we learn that we're not meeting, we're not moving in the direction of meeting our goals. There's a chance of redirecting the, 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 uh, what the commission is doing uh, rather than just forecasting and hoping for the best. So am I understanding the intention here correctly? Um, because it was, seen, it's not, at, from my perspective, we're not backing away from meeting our goals. Uh, what we're doing is trying to understand on a more regular basis on a, along the way how well we're doing in meeting our goals so we can redirect if necessary. Um, you're correct, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, the forecasting methodology would be to take a look at the future and try to project uh, what you think might be happening in the future. So that's the forecasting model. And then the monitoring in real time model is actually, in a way, more accountability to the goals because we're looking at how things are currently and how they compare against where we want to be. So it's a more precise methodology and it also is um, current instead of future. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's, what I, that's how I understood it. Yeah, Commissioner Schiffer made my first point, uh, but the other point I wanted to respond to is on uh, the, one of the reasons that the drop in vehicle miles traveled is as large as it is in the period that you're looking at because we went through a five-year recession in which people stopped going to work, not by choice, I assume. Um, and so that those numbers are a little inflated over what actually was going on in terms of the long-term trends. Not that we won't have another recession in the future that would give us another one of these or positive benefits from a nightmare situation where people can't find work. Commissioner Rotkin, if I may, um, point of clarification on that. Um, Target 1.B.1 um, that the member of the public was speaking of has, has now become reduced per capita vehicle miles traveled. So that is the reason for the difference in the numbers before it was total vehicle miles traveled. Thanks. Any other comments? Move approval of the staff recommendation. Second. Moved by Rotkin, second by Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay, we will, uh, that uh, concludes our agenda for today. The next meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission will, will be Thursday at 9 a.m., uh, Thursday, March 5th at 9 a.m. in the Board of Supervisors Chamber in Santa Cruz, 701 Ocean Street, 5th floor. This meeting is adjourned.